Hello and welcome to episode 242 of the Thinking LSAT podcast in Vienna, Virginia. This is Ben Olson. With me is Nathan Fox in Los Angeles. Yep, LA. There's nowhere to go, right? <laughs> no. Nope. There's the walk around the neighborhood, oh, which I've been doing like daily. And uh, yeah, that's it. My big exciting thing last night was that I ordered what I thought was delivery and then it didn't show up for like an hour. And then I double checked, and it turns out that I had ordered takeout. Oh, yeah. I did the same thing two weeks ago. Yeah. So then I was Mm -hmm. like, oh, disaster. Oh, no, this is horrible. And then I had, because, you know, normally Friday night in LA, like, you don't want to drive somewhere to go pick something up. And, yeah. But instead, it was like a literally five minute drive, (laughs) (laughs) like right into Hollywood. I had to like drive across parts of Hollywood that, just would have been a disaster on any other, you know, normal Friday night. And instead it was just like cruise right over there, pick it up, cruise back home. No problem. <laughs> it's such a weird world. Have you been it driving around at all? I want to drive around yeah. just to like look mm-hmm. at stuff. Yeah, no, I love it. I mean, I guess we can't, can't expect it to stay like this forever, but boy, yeah. I mean, you know, the DC area, it's, it's got its own traffic woes and right. It's just like, oh, I can go over to this store and get this thing. It's not like I'm going out a lot, but when I do, it's always clear. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. But I did the same thing with Chipotle. I ordered food, and I, I just was thinking in my head, you know, drop off or whatever, or they would deliver it, and then it was like pick up. It was their default, I guess. And I was watching a movie with the kids, and they are like, I was like, oh, I got to go pick this up. But we were watching the movie, and I just kept procrastinating it. And eventually, the kids are like, "Just go get the food, Dad. We're hungry." <laughs> I'm like, "Okay, okay. I'll pull myself from this B-rate movie and go get it." <laughs> What's uh, two questions? What what movie? That's the thing. I don't even remember. Now. <laughs> it must have been great. Oh, and- you know what? It was a Marvel movie. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. They they want to, you know, do a marathon and get through those. Boy, if those don't come back, I'm not going to be disappointed. Yeah. There's like a couple of them were good, but it's just like by now I'm just so over it. Oh, no. It's just to make money. Yeah. And can't blame them, though. If I was making that much money off of uh, movies like that, I'd keep doing them. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) Man, can you not? Disney must just be so fucked by all this corona (laughs) closing down these gigantic theme parks worldwide. Oh, yeah. Oh, and also no revenue from movie theaters. I was thinking about Disney Plus, though. That's been a huge success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they've got brilliant finger in many pies, so yeah, <laughs> they're they're going to be fine. I'm not saying I feel sorry for them, but I, you know, like, can you imagine how many people they had to lay off and everything? Yeah, this is wild. Yeah. Um, that is wild. My, my other question was, uh, what is your default, your go to uh, Chipotle order? Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, it's just a chicken bowl with brown rice, both black and pinto beans, guac, tomatoes, corn, and I think I used to get fajitas, but ever since they had that, um, (laughs) remember when they had those problems, like with people getting sick? Like E. coli? Yeah. They started overcooking their fajita vegetables. Uh, Yeah. And they've always been gross since. So uh, I don't get those anymore. But anyways, yeah, that's what I get. That's it. No, you don't go for the hot salsa? No. Not a spicy guy? Uh, No. I mean, I like it sometimes. I use salsa or spicy stuff to make foods that I don't like taste better, but that's... (laughs) I don't even like Chipotle that much, honestly. Chipotle's not that good. No, it's not. But it's cheap, and when you have to feed, you know, four kids, it's like... The boys must love it. Yeah, they like it, and, you know... It's like it remembers your past order on their app. Not that oh, it's nice. like a shrill for Chipotle. I actually don't like their food. No. But it's cheap. Every time I go there, I'm like, man, I fed everybody. There's leftovers. It took me like no time at all. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to ruin Chipotle for everybody. Um, yeah, go for it. Well, not for everybody, but for some percentage of the population. My buddy, uh, Mike, in Santa Barbara, he, he ruined Chipotle for me. I used to like it, and I have like hardly even eaten it since he told me. It's not that it's not that bad, but he he pointed out that normally when you get Chipotle, it's just not that hot. Mm. And then I got like a burrito or something, and I realized that like yeah, it was like kind of 
lukewarm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the veg and the lettuce is always like gross. Like if you get the lettuce in the salad, it's gross. It's like you know, starting to go bad. Yeah. Wilty. Yeah. It's 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 not that good. Chipotle is no. it's it's I really really like their hot salsa. It's awesome. Hmm. The chips and yeah. salsa at Chipotle is pretty good, but the yeah, the whole the whole like kind of lukewarm tepid steam table full of meat and beans and stuff. <laughs> What Sorry. happened to them? We're going to get they more so hate mail awesome, for that man. than we have gotten for anything we've ever done before, by the you way. You think so? Yeah. You think so? I mean, like, oh, yeah. they've really gone downhill. Because remember when they were, like, the shit, and everybody's like, this is the greatest idea ever. You walk through, and you pick what you want, and you're done. <laughs> it's amazing. And everybody started copying them. You had, like, these, like, oh, we're going to do it for Mediterranean food, and we're going to do right. it for this. And, like, Kava came out and all these other places. It's like... The leader is now this like ho hum. It used. To, I remember in D.C. at lunchtime, the line would be out the door down the street yeah. in front of Chipotle. Now it's like crickets in there. You know, people love Chipotle, and some people are going to see that as a personal attack on them. Um, but <laughs> well, it is. Just <laughs> next time you eat Chipotle, just think about notice how hot or not hot it is. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to ruin hmm. it for you. The title of this episode will be 242, uh, Why Chipotle Sucks. <laughs> um, and the Elsa. Today on the show, we're going to, oh, we have a review of the podcast in the Demon. Hope it's positive. We're going to talk about LSAT Flex. The LSAT did go online after all, um, at least for uh, May. And we're going to talk about some pearls versus turds. We have some desperate schools out there. Who are taking desperate measures and seat deposits are magically not such a big deal. Yeah. They lead to more money. We'll talk about that. Anyways, someone has a question about teaching English in Japan before law school. I'm so tempted to say something in Japanese right now, but I will resist. Okay. You convinced me not to go to law school. That's the last topic. Yep. Oh, good. Good. Monday, April 20th. That's when this will come out. Hopefully, um, we got a real short turnaround for Adam this week since we're recording on Saturday and the show's supposed to come out on Monday. But uh, thank you, Adam. Hopefully, we'll get this one out on time. Yes, fingers crossed. The June LSAT registration deadline is in four days. Okay, has that been pushed back? As far as I know, it has not been pushed back yet. Okay, I am clicking on the link just to verify. Yep. It is still Friday, April 24th. That's the registration deadline for the June LSAT, which is mm, perplexing to me. I mean, who knows what's going to happen with that. But I guess if you want to have the opportunity to take that test or to take whatever they offer in lieu of that test, you will need to sign up for it. That's kind of what happened with uh, LSAT Flex, right? Like, it's only available to those who were signed up for the April LSAT. Anyways, the June LSAT is on June 8th. That's a Monday. If you have questions, email the show at help at thinkinglsat.com. Send us your selfies if you're so inclined. Leave us a review on iTunes, positive or negative. It helps us know you're listening. All right. Well, you want to read this review? Yeah, it's an email from uh, Jake. Jake says, hey, Nathan and Ben. It seems like much longer ago than eight months that I binged this podcast to get my mindset right. I was on the law school admissions Reddit when I heard of the new at-home LSAT, LOL. It reminded me how much this podcast improved both my score and studying experience. I just wanted to say thank you for everything and provide listeners with a positive anecdote. I had a diagnostic of 152 last May and improved to a 169 for my September LSAT through listening to the podcast using Fox LSAT and then cramming with the demon for a month leading up. Uh, thank you. I mean, by the way, Fox also, that's not really even a thing anymore. There's just the demon nowadays, but um, thank you very much. I'm currently deciding between Northwestern and Duke with greater than half ride scholarships at each. Cool. Currently using negotiation advice I learned on the show to leverage them for maximum offers. Thanks again. You two are elite. Elite. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if that's like a compliment these days. Right? Elite. Like, you are elite. Yeah. I'll take it in like a video game, like a <laughs> video game sense. Right? Elite. Sorry. I don't know why that's so funny. I just think in this day and age, like everybody's so on edge. You Thanks know? again. You two are the 1%. <laughs> 
<laughs> you are the one percent of the one percent. Oh man. Uh, okay, thanks, cool. Jake. That's awesome. Yeah, we appreciate it. We know it was positive. I didn't really. Yeah. Anyways, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, one thing, Jake, you said um, you have greater than half ride scholarships at Northwestern and Duke. Yeah. My real question is, okay, but what's your out the door cost for both of those? It sounds like you're kind of focusing on what you're getting in terms of a discount, but I'm more curious about what you're paying uh, after you apply that discount. And that would include, um, you know, living expenses and so on. Piling on to that, I also want to know what the best full ride is you have. I, you know, I, I don't want those yeah. to be your only yes. two schools that you're yes. thinking about yep. unless again, unless you, if you've got family money or something, you know, somebody in your <laughs> <You're> elite. <laughs> yeah. Right. Somebody, yeah. if somebody in your family, you know, owns a law firm or has just made a money and they're willing to pay for, for your school, then great. But like Duke at 50% off or Northwestern at 50% off, um, doesn't excite me. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm like, okay, well let's talk about, you know, maybe some schools outside the top 14 who are offering you a full ride. And let's like really be honest about what you're getting because the, the tuitions are just so <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, Ben, I was talking to um, Namdi the other day. Remember your student Namdi who came yeah, on the podcast? I remember Namdi. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's writing a book. He's taking a hiatus from law school and he's writing a book um, about okay. being uh, like first generation student yep. and I'm a first generation student. So he was talking to me about my experiences, but um, we looked up the Columbia uh, 509 hmm. and I was just shocked. I mean, I guess I already knew this, but the per semester tuition at Columbia is 34,000 something. Thirty four. Thousand dollars per yeah. semester, seventy yeah. grand or well, sixty-eight, but yeah, yeah, seventy grand a year. That's just tuition. That's not even living expenses. Probably not fees. Definitely not books. You know, it's not at all like total cost of a total cost of attendance. And uh, obviously, Duke and Northwestern uh, are you know they're not in New York City, so they're not going to be as expensive. But uh, they're they're still like outrageously expensive. I mean, I, I, off the top of my head, I'm sure that Northwestern and Duke are 50000 plus a year. Yeah. So a 50% scholarship is still just like outrageously expensive. It's, a, it's still just unrealistically, it, it's, not, it's not worth it. I, I, I can't imagine that it's worth it. You know, I think going forward, we need to edit, verbally edit all references to the word scholarship. I agree. We've tried to do this in the past. Yeah. We just need to remind ourselves maybe, and listeners will catch on, but we could replace it with discount, yep. but you could also, you know, try to emphasize this a little bit more. Um, discount, what is a good word for this? But it's a discount from an inflated price, right? right? So it's like, um, what are those sham? It's, it makes me think of JCPenney's and all these stores. I don't know, JCPenney's doesn't even exist anymore, right? Um, <laughs> with their like, the white sale or whatever. Yeah, it's where, like, they're, like they're they have sales so frequently that the it's you you're like an idiot if you ever don't buy anything on sale. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this happens at Gap. I was just there the other day. I I don't know why I was there, but I remember like pretty much everything was fifty percent off. Oh, I think I got yeah. it. Yeah, I, I think I got it. Instead of scholarship, we say Bed Bath and Beyond coupon. <laughs> Is there a store that has fewer words in it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of a, it's, it's, I like it that it's kind of a clunky. It makes it more of an insult. But I mean, that's yeah. But that's what it is, though, right? It's like yeah. If you go to Bed Bath and Beyond and you don't have one of those just ubiquitous coupons that they are constantly yeah. sending to anyone who yeah. has ever bought anything at Bed Bath and Beyond, like if you don't have one of those, then you're paying an outrageously inflated price. If you have one of those, then you're paying the price. Oh, how about this? Promo code. <laughs> yeah. You know? Like when oh, you buy God. something, they're like, what's your promo code? And you're like, shit, who else is getting this discount that I'm not? Uh, yeah. You know? It's like, yeah. yep, that's what's happening. Do yep. you have the promo code or not? Because and even if you do have a promo code, you're still not getting a deal. That's just like, <laughs> that's the price that they want everyone to pay. They're trying to get yeah. people to pay that price. 
<laughs> you got you got the free shipping promo code. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sucker. Oh, there was a buy one get one free. There was a fifty percent off one. You oh, yeah. you got the free shipping one. Uh. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. We, we okay. So when we when we see the word scholarship, yep, we say promo code. Promo code. I'm yeah. also going to say Bed Bath and Beyond coupon sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> BBB. <laughs> yeah. All right. BBB coupon. Cool, man. So this is. Uh, let's talk about LSAT Flex. By the way, I saw that you did a video for that this week, and that got up on Instagram at Thinking LSAT, nice. I believe. So thanks for making that video. Yeah. Oh, I guess I should read this. This is a so long is, ass email. Do we want to read this whole mm, thing? They even acknowledge that it's long ass by bolding one, two, three, four, five sentences. Yeah. I guess we could start with those and then expand on them if we need to. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and um, yeah? Why don't you read the the bolded parts maybe? Okay. This is from Eric our new correspondent with the rest of the world from LSAC headquarters in Newton, Pennsylvania. He says, um, the email is entitled updates from LSAC. Well, gee, that's okay. Not very informative. It would have been better to say LSAT's (laughs) going online, but anyways, uh, LSAT flex is going to be taking place in May. His first bolded sentence says we expect, and by the way, LSAT Flex, which is taking place in May, is only for the April LSAT test takers. For right? now. Those who are signed up for, uh, yeah, and it might, that might expand, but right now that's the case. Yeah. We expect that most test takers will test on either Monday, May 18th or Tuesday, May 19th, with a smaller number of tests occurring later in the week based on specific remote proctoring requirements. We will be notifying test takers of scheduling instructions via email. Okay. This is so bizarre to me because if they're expecting people to potentially cheat on this exam, I don't understand why they don't narrow the window in which you can take this. But anyways, that's what's going to happen. Next bolded sentence, we will open the scheduling sign-up process next Wednesday, April 22nd, so that May test takers can select the available time that works best for them. We will be sending out more information, blah, blah, blah. Okay. We will release scores for all test takers on the same day, regardless of when they test during the week of May 18th. We're currently shooting for Friday, June 5th. Okay. Huh. Three days before the June LSAT. We are extending the deadline for the April registrants to tell us if they want to take the (laughs) May That's already passed, though. Oh. Oops, I missed that. Okay, Friday, April 17th. They sent that out like three days. I mean, it was like two days or three days before that deadline that they extended it. I think the email came out after their previous deadline had already passed, or maybe the deadline was like that day or something. But they, you know, they're obviously scrambling. So they had to email everybody and say, hey, you got to tell us whether you want to take the test or not. It yeah. does say they, that, and I don't know how that went down either. Um, I'd love to hear if any uh, listeners were registered for April. It looks like you had to tell them, it says, tell us if they want to take the May test or not. Yeah, so you had to opt in as opposed to I'm wondering if you had to opt in, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, anyway. They said, I I like this sentence, it's not bolded, but finally, we have received a lot of support for the LSAT flex from candidates and schools, and we've also received a lot of questions. You've received a lot of support for this <laughs> from candidates and schools. Especially schools, because schools are desperate, and they're like, yeah. please they're like, let people take the LSAT so that we can try to get them to come to our school. They're realizing that they have this sham process. Anyways, I what do I want to say about this? I want to talk about the, the crazy change to the test. I, mean, I think that's... Oh, yeah, let's talk about that's that. That's the important part. So, I mean... Oh, we should clarify. If you're just catching up with us now, LSAT Flex is LSAT's solution. They're going to put the test online. And as you're about to say, right, it's a three-section yeah. test, and that's it. So there's no experimental, and they're dropping one of the logical reasoning questions, and you can take it from your home. This is a big change. Yeah, and it, it is a big change, although it doesn't really change what you need to do as a student. So we, I got lots of students freaking out, calling me, asking me all kinds of questions about what they should do differently. Mm-hmm. The answer is essentially nothing, but we can talk about it a little bit, Ben. We need to explain this for people because people are going to want to try to figure out what their LSAT flex score is, and I have some thoughts yeah. about it. 
Okay. So here's what they did. They decided that they needed to shorten the test because they don't want to give you a break. So instead of three sections, take a break, come back, do two sections, they cut the experimental section, which didn't count anyway, and they cut one of the logical reasoning sections. So now the test is one section of games, one section of reading comp, one section of logical reasoning, and you're done. I don't know what order can you, they're going to be Can you in. tell me why they don't want anyone to take a break? Cheating is the only thing I can think of. I don't understand how you could cheat during a break. You go to the bathroom and your friend comes out and takes the test in your place. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Something I mean, I like guess that. if you have some sort of verification process at the beginning of the test, just right. do the same thing after the break. Re-verify. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm a little perplexed by that. I mean, I guess people who are cheaters would would know and maybe like, yeah, of course. Well, this is what you do. Oh, please um, email but, help at thinkinglsat.com with whatever your best cheating strategies are for the LSAT flex. I mean, we would love to hear, like there's gotta yeah. be stuff that we're not thinking of, but not that we're encouraging you to cheat. Just, it's fun to think about how people sure. would cheat if they were going to cheat. Yeah. And we, we would like to be the number one source for you know, <laughs> cheating methodology. <laughs> well, the, so here, but it's just, it's, it's so strange though. So, they people asked them they did their webinar or whatever and people immediately were asking them like hey so does this mean that you're going to double the score from the lr section because the previous yeah. lsat was two sections of lr one section of games one section of reading comp so games counts for one quarter of the test reading comp counts for one quarter of the test lr counts for one half of the test mm-hmm. but they're not doing that so they are going to have a different scoring scale, of course, because there's only going to be you know roughly 75 questions on the test instead of 100 mm-hmm. scored questions. Yeah, But they're not making any adjustment for the fact that they have reduced the amount of logical reasoning on the test. And so what it appears to me that they have done is they have changed it so that now, the for the LSAT Flex anyway, games mm-hmm. is going to count for more. Games is going to count for a third of the test. Same with reading comp. Reading comp. Counts for a third of the test. And LR, yeah. which used to count for half of the test, now counts for only a third. Mm-hmm. I, uh, you know, the irony there, I mean, which section is most like lawyer shit? <laughs> the logical reasoning. Yes, of course. The logical reasoning is mm-hmm. if they made the entire test logical reasoning, it would be a better test of your like lawyer capacity, in my view. I agree. Or, or really a mix of reading comp and logical reasoning. Because yeah. I do feel like. Yeah. Reading comp feels a lot like law school, but games? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Well, the games is just like a test of how hard you can work, right? It's just like, can you prep for this and figure it out? I mean, it's, it is a test of your like cognitive capacity in, a, in, a, in interesting ways, but yeah, there's no like clown getting out of a clown car in order in like law school or legal practice. But the logical reasoning you know, building arguments, figuring out what argument is being made Mm -hmm. and figuring out what's Mm -hmm. there and what's not there and all the different fallacies and all, you know, it's like, of course, that's very, very lawyerly. And so now for LSAT Flex, it counts for less. But they had an easy fix, Ben. It's an elegant Hmm. solution. Would you like to hear it? I'd love to hear it. They could have just doubled the score for logical reasoning. Wait, wait, can you say that again? Can you explain it to me? I'm a little confused. Um, What? Uh, Your solution. Oh, I, ha- I haven't explained the solution yet, but it is it is an elegant solution. So one would no, be the doubling score. The one, yes. What does that mean exactly? You double the well, score. You just make the you just make the logical reasoning questions count for two points instead of one. <laughs> I know. I'm just, I'm just messing <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's not <laughs> yeah, my solution. It's easy, yeah, it's an elegant solution to their original problem. But okay, what's your, I have an even better solution. solution. Okay, yeah, I like it. Mm-hmm. It makes the math work out perfectly. Okay. All you do is you change the L the LG and the reading comp. You make it two games instead of four, and you make mm-hmm. it two passages instead of four. Mm-hmm. You make it mm-hmm. half the number of questions and half the time. Yep. Mm-hmm. So in one fell swoop, Ben, this yep. shortens the test even more, which apparently they were worried about, mm-hmm. and it restores the balance of it makes it so that the LR is now worth fifty percent again, and the games are worth twenty five percent, and the reading comp is worth twenty five percent. Boom. So basically you just like take, I mean, I don't know which games you would pick, like game one and game three or game one and game four. Sure. Right. And then like Mm -hmm. the first reading comp passage and whatever the hardest reading comp passage was. Yeah. And then that's your section. It's just like a mini section and you make it 18 minutes. Boom. So you cut another 35 minutes out of the section and then you don't have to rebound. I just, it's so strange that they chose to 
like their solution is, oh yeah, no, 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 we're just, it's the same. It's all the same except for, yeah, I mean, they're like in the background, they're also changing the balance of the scoring of the test for no reason. Hmm. I don't get it. Anyway, students are freaking out about like what they should do about it if they're prepping for the flags. Mm -hmm. And the answer is basically nothing. So people are like, should I only take three sections now? Or, you know, should I practice this new timing or whatever? Yeah. There's nothing different about it. On the day of the test, you were going to go in and take three sections back to back to back, then take a break, then take two more sections. Yep. Now you're just taking three sections back to back to back and you're done. Boom. So I don't see why you need to practice anything. No, LSAT Flex is going to be easier. Yes, it's shorter. It's at home. Ideally, it should be less stress. But, you know, it, it, yeah, I, I do think that it's, it should be easier. What about if someone wants to know what their score would have been in LSAT Flex world? Do we have ways of doing that? Hmm. Well, if they're going to equally weight the sections, I don't know what they're going to do, though. I mean, are they, they, did they say that they're actually going to equally weight them? They said they are not going to count the logical reasoning for more. Okay, so if that's what they're going to do, then at least what I would do, this is just what's coming to my mind, but I would take the first three unique sections, so games, reading comp, and LR, and I would see what, pers- like, let's say that's, that's roughly 75 questions, right? I think if you just multiply it by four-thirds. Yeah. Right. Exactly. You just take your score, you multiply it by four thirds and you say, okay, what is that? Yeah. Where does that fall on the scale? Take your number correct out of mm-hmm. three sections, mm-hmm. multiply it by four thirds, and that'll put you on a hundred point or roughly a hundred point scale. And then you can use the same existing scoring scale. You could also take the other section of LR and then you could recalculate it if that was your LR section, right? So same games, same reading comp the other LR, multiply it by four thirds, and then use the same scale again. Well, one thing you'll interestingly see here is you'll see some a swing, right? You have one extreme is with one LR section, another extreme is with the other LR section. The reality is you're probably going to be somewhere in between. Yeah, so you could average those two. But that's mm-hmm. the only way that I could think of that would be, and who knows what they're going to actually do on the back end, you know, yeah. Of course, they're not going to explain what's in the black box, but I think that if you do either of those things, you're, you'll have some idea what your flex score would be. I don't think it's yeah. going to really impact most people because people who are like super great at the games tend to be like not super great at re- reading comp. I mean, unless mm-hmm. you're great at all, the, at all the sections, right? If you're great at all the sections, then it doesn't matter. Yeah, but if there te- there tends to be kind of like. I guess it's an inverse correlation between games and reading comp. If mm-hmm. if you're like some people reading comp is their natural strength and games is their weakest. Mm-hmm. Other people games is their natural strength and reading comp is their weakest. Yeah. So it's not going to actually change your, those people. It's not going to really ma- matter that much. Like the only yeah. person that it really changes is somebody who is great at LR and sucks at the other two sections. Mm -hmm. or sucks at LR and is great at the other two sections. And I just don't know that that person actually exists. It would be pretty uncommon, right? Uh, That's not something that we see a lot. Yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe it makes no no difference. I hear you. Cool. Uh, These questions from Dylan, so, you know, people are just asking, like, this is, I guess, from Facebook, from our Facebook group, group maybe okay. uh, mm-hmm. thinking also yep. podcast group on Facebook, by the way, you know, should I take two text tests per week now instead of one, because it'll be easier to review. I guess that assumes that he's doing three sections instead of four or five. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Or should I just stick with five sections? I mean, like Saturdays, we're still doing five section practice tests, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like Ben said, if you just take the first three sections of that, that's your LSAT flex, but why not do the other two sections too? Yeah. I mean, you're trying to prep, right? Yeah. Abigail says, do you guys think this will give LSAT flex takers an advantage over traditional test takers? I know I was rubbing my eyes by the fifth section when I took the test. I would have loved to be done after three sections. I understand the need to move the test online, but I don't think it's fair that online test takers get to do less work. Uh, I think in general, make it easier. (laughs) 
I don't see why I, I would rather do three sections than five. I don't think it's that much different, but I think it's easier. It's just like a workout. Yeah. You want to do five sets or three sets? It's like, yeah, I can do three sets more intensely than I can do five sets. So I don't know what to say. Life isn't fair. Yeah, totally. Yeah, life is not fair. I attended LSAC's, this is Abigail still, I attended LSAC's webinar today about the LSAT flex, and they confirmed the three sections will be weighted equally. Logical reasoning will count for one third of this test. Many people commented that this makes the test much different than the traditional test. By the way, that would be different. Wait, did I say different than? And it says different from on the page. I was about to beat her up for saying different than, and it's actually different from on the page. Wow, you anticipated Nathan. a mistake, introduced that mistake, and then corrected that mistake. Beat myself up for making the mistake because <laughs> she actually did not. Jesus Christ. Okay. Some complained that they spent more money and time prepping for LR with the expectation that it would count for one half of the score. <laughs> that's hilarious future lawyers like just complaining about time and money yeah that does i spent um, more time and money prepping for lr this is not fair <laughs> wow. wow i you know abigail i would let it go i mean there's so many things in this life that are unfair yeah and even within the lsat context right like people who have the money to prepare in ways that other people don't and the time that they have it's not just the money you have available to you but the time that you have because you have to work for your family or your parents or yourself in a way that other people don't have to work for themselves this is only going to affect a small number of people it's the people who are signed up for the april lsat and lsac is going to flag it on their score report as an lsac LSAT flex test. So, uh, you know, law schools are going to know it's a little different. I don't know that it's going to matter that much. The, the bottom line here is even if it is unfair, and I agree it might be, um, there's nothing you can do about it except just keep getting better at the test so that when you take it, whether that's LSAT flex or not, you get the best score you can possibly get. Yeah, I agree. Check out this next uh Check out this next email. Yeah. You want to read it? Sure. Oh, the anonymous one? Yeah. Okay. LSEC Flex can be gamed relatively simply. Hopefully anyone wanting to be a lawyer wouldn't do this. Okay. (laughs) Here's a rule from Proctor U. Proctor U. No running inside a virtual machine. You will be asked to reconnect using your host operating system to take your exam. Huh? However... There is a whole field in cybersecurity research, something I study, of avoiding the detection of virtual machines. When running potential malicious software in a virtual VM, I I don't know what that is. Virtual Virtual machine. Virtual machine. Oh, oh, of course. Sorry. The malicious software may check if it's being ran into a virtualized environment, deleting itself if so as a means of preventing a security researcher from seeing how the malicious software operates. Both of these advanced techniques are widely used in the malicious software nation states. In the malicious software nation states use. Okay. However, there are ways around this. Google, circumventing virtual machine detection, one can look at, a sec- at security blogs and other sources to see how one can do this. One with a moderate level of IT ability, okay, I'm, this sentence is like convoluted for me at mm-hmm. least, and can follow instructions could set this up. Okay, so if you if you yeah, if you got a little bit of know how, you can you can do this. Mm-hmm. Okay, one simply would use any remote desktop solution to control one's computer and the virtual machine. Test taker would sit there, show their ID, etc. Sent this anonymously just in case. Just to make it clear, I'm not saying that I have set this up for someone to circumvent a Proctor U exam. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Proctor U, what is that even referring to? Uh, Maybe that's the software they're using to for the LSAT flex. Maybe that's what they used for the uh, maybe that's what they used for or are using for the writing, LSAT writing. Hmm. Oh, gotcha. I don't know. This guy thinks he can get around it. Anonymous thinks he can get around it. Yeah, bottom line, this is uh, okay. Hmm. I would estimate like 1% of our students are savvy enough to do that. I think most of our students see one of those words 
Like, really? Changing CPU ID and v- virtual machine peripheral names? Yeah. <laughs> I can see the eyes glazing over of, like, every single person who's listening to this. There's, like, one dude who's listening to this who's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, and they already did it. So, And then what do you do? You have someone else take the test for you? I guess that's... Yeah, you've got your your 170-plus buddy in the room mm-hmm. or online somewhere just feeding you the answers. Hmm. It seems like some portion of the people are going to cheat, but what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Can you read the questions out loud to yourself? <laughs> I that would imagine would... you can. Like That would be real weird if they were like, no, you have to be silent. Well, because you just have someone sit on the other side of the computer. Yeah. And you read them to yourself and they process them. It's harder than doing it on paper, but they could be like, yeah, go with A. <laughs> well, they, they're they going to monitor the noise in the room. They just give you hand signals, right? They're One also going to monitor your eyes. So if you're hmm. always looking off the screen, but hmm. although, I mean, they can't, surely they can't expect that you're going to sit there for two hours with your eyes just glued to the screen. <laughs> like all you have to do is flash up for one second, like you're thinking. You hmm. don't even actually have to look up because you know, when you, you're looking down, you have your peripheral vision. So the person just has to be behind the monitor. They're like one and you can see it. <laughs> you're like, okay, hey, got it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, did we just figure out how to, one? okay, don't use that method, sorry, oh shit. Um, anyways, <laughs> well, who knows, it might not work anyway. So. For $10 million, I'll come to your house, and I'll sit behind <laughs> your laptop screen, and you can read the questions out loud to me, and I'll give you hand signals about what the answers are. Hey, dude, let's talk about the $10 million for a second. Yeah. You know, people always say, oh, I'd never do this for blah, 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 and I'm like, God, if there was really some amount of money, you would do this. So... Is it ten million or is it lower? Like, what if someone really offered you a million bucks? I just feel like I'd have to skip skip town or something. I feel like my whole career would be at je- in jeopardy. And I used to say a million. I used to say for a million, I would just go take the test for you. Yeah, and it was like always a joke. I mean, it still is a joke. Obviously, I'm not going to do this. But you've I only used- done it a couple times, right? <laughs> yeah, I used to say for a million, I'll just go like you know we'll get. You have to kind of look like me. So that mm-hmm. I can like just use your ID or whatever about it. Now, I mean, I'm too old. It's not going to work. But for, I used to say a million, but then I, I revised it up because I was like, man, I have a whole career. Like, I mean, and I might have to like leave the country. I might have to flee mm-hmm. they might, when they send the FBI after me. I mean, I guess they could do that, right? Because it would be like, it would be like the whole, um, <laughs> the USC bullshit that happened. Wait, have you broken any law though? If you sit behind a computer and just do hand signals? I would think that they would be able to say that that's a fraud against the law schools. Because that's how... Well, the candidate would be in trouble. They've made an agreement, but... Oh, you're saying I haven't. Uh, I bet I'm complicit in a fraud. I think that that's Mm. a... I I mean, because like all those people... Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know what actually happened to the people with the college admission scandal shit. Yeah. It was like, how, how is that, how, who did you, who's the crime against, you know, if you helped somebody cheat on the SAT, Mm -hmm. but I think it's a fraud against all of the schools or whatever. I don't know. Hmm. Fraud. Unfair. Yeah. Unfair. Everything's unfair. All right. Should we move on off of the LSAT flex? Basically don't worry about it. I mean, you know, keep doing what you've been doing. If you're good at the sections, if you're good at each of the different sections, you're going to be fine on the LSAT flex. And if you suck at any of the three sections you're going to struggle on the LSAT flex so get good at the stuff you're not good at <laughs> it's pretty simple <laughs> people are like well should i immediately change my balance of how i prep it's like oh, i don't know if you if you want to do a little less lr and a little more games and reading comp okay yeah but it, this is not a like a crazy change to your life yep want to read the pearls versus turds yeah i do Hello, Ben and Nathan. What do you guys think of this piece of advice? Quote, when answering questions during the last five minutes, you should choose the answer you think is correct immediately after reading it, even if you haven't read through all of the other answer choices. If you end up learning one, if you end up learning one of the other choices is correct, you can go ahead and switch your answer. What? If you end up learning, how would you learn it if you didn't read it? This method helps you get your answer in even if time runs out while you're reading the other answer choices. Oh, I see. They're saying 
So they're saying click the answer. But wait, don't you have to hit submit? Nope. You don't have to hit submit as long as mm-hmm. you have an as long as you have an answer selected. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this is only this is this is piece of advice is trying to get that one fraction of a question, the one that you're working on while time is running out. So you read A and you think that might be the answer and you click it. Mhm. Yep. Well, this person does say when answering questions during the last five minutes. Well, yeah, because you want you have to do it for the whole last five minutes so that you're sure that when the time runs out, you've got an answer selected. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Basically, okay. basically, as you read A, I mean, in that case, why don't you just click A before you even read it? Right. Just well, click heck, A. You could just and read do this a. at any time during the test. Right. You're going. You read A. And you're like, yeah, I think that's the answer. Select it and then just keep reading. <laughs> right. And then change it. <laughs> Because it changes like lickety split, right? It's not like the old days where you had to bubble it in and then un like erase it. If you're like, oh no, actually, I don't think it's A anymore. I think it's D. Yeah, I wouldn't want this people to do this if it biased them in some ways, but I don't really care about the clicking process. You want to keep reading? I created this piece of advice. You created this piece of advice. <laughs> Trademark. <laughs> <laughs> because I was answering a question during the latter part of the last five minutes, and I read answer A, and I felt it was correct. However, I did not choose it because I wanted to go through all of the other answer choices. Unfortunately, time ran out while I was reading through the other choices, so I never got to choose A, which turned out to be correct. <sighs> Cry emoji, right? Mm-hmm. No, this person didn't put that, but I'm putting that. <laughs> um, yeah. Sure. I mean, I guess I don't really care. Like, if if you think an answer choice is correct and you select it, and then as you're going through the rest, you decide one is better and thus correct, change it. I I don't see a problem with that. I I don't know that I would. I would not be suggesting this in class because I think it adds complexity yeah. where there doesn't need to be any. But I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. It says, respectfully, Long Beach Kaiba, former online student of Nathan and veteran podcast listener. Thank you, Kaiba, for listening, and thanks for studying with us. I I would give it a tie. This is nothing I would ever say. I would never teach anyone this tip. Mm-hmm. I kind of wish we would have never put ties on the scoreboard, Ben. I kind of mm-hmm. wish we had to go pearls or turds. Because I feel like it's a bailout, you know, just a compromise to go like, well, all right, fine, tie, you know. Yeah, But the truth is, I think it's a turd because I would never say this to someone. If I did say this to someone, I feel like I would be flooding their brain with shit that doesn't really matter. You know what I mean? It's like a rearranging the deck chairs yes. type of so a situation. So the information is not necessarily bad. It's not like... It's not actively con- encouraging you to do something bad, but the mere fact that you have been overloaded with this information is itself a distraction. Yeah. And that is what makes exactly. it bad. So yeah. even if this, I mean, okay, this could only ever be worth, well, at best, it would be worth one point per section. Mm-hmm. And it's never going to actually be worth one point per section, right? Most of the time, you're going to run out of time while you're reading the argument, or you're going to, you know, you've got A clicked, but it turns out that the answer is actually E. <laughs> so, you know, most of the time, yeah. this is not going to get you anything extra. It's going to get you a fraction of a point. But it's going to cost you more than a fraction of a point because you're thinking about it. It's like that yep. stupid thing where, you know, they've done all those analyses of, like, on logical reasoning, the most popular answer in the last five Based on our historical analysis, 22% yeah. of the time, it's D. And it's like, even if that's true, and even if it is true on your test, and even if it was going to actually get you one-tenth of a point or whatever more in expectation, it definitely costs you more than a tenth of a point in expectation because you're thinking about that instead of thinking about the question in front of you. Yeah. This and I would say that's even worse than this because there's like specific answer choices and question types or section types you have to remember. Like that is just bad. But I agree. This is the same kind of thing. I vote turd. It's fine. Doesn't matter whether it's neutral or turd. <laughs> Don't think about it, right? I would never teach anyone this. I would just, I would like, 
this is the it's wait you just voted turd but then you put it in the neutral pile no yeah no it goes wins losses ties oh ties are at the end yeah okay. that's the way they always do sports i just corrected you and i was wrong <laughs> well i wonder <laughs> wonder where you got that from i learned it from watching you all right desperate schools desperate measures this is this is unbelievable this is an email from this was forwarded to us from an applicant. This has truly been redacted. We have black lines over this email. Yeah, but I think we can look. <laughs> we select and copy. Yeah, you can still see who it is. See? I know who it is. But anyway, this is crazy. I'll just read it. Mm-hmm. It's from ASU Law, Admissions, and Financial Aid. The subject is Additional Scholarship Funds Available. It says, We hope you are in good health and good spirits. We noticed that you did not submit your first seat deposit with us here at ASU Law. We wanted to let you know that additional scholarship funds were recently yeah, made available. That, what? Additional promo oh, codes. Oh, sorry. We wanted to let you know that additional <laughs> promo codes were ma- recently made available. <laughs> if you would like to have a conversation about promo code opportunities for fall of 2020, please let us know by emailing us at... They give their email address. Otherwise, we wish you the best of luck and welcome any feedback about our admissions process or information about where you will be attending this fall. Just give us free intelligence about what you're planning to do. Sincerely, Office of Admissions and Financial Aid. Just the amazing thing about this is that this guy straight ignored their deposit deadline. Yep. He had no intention of going to the school. He straight ignored them. Yep. And they sent him an unsolicited offer of a better discount. Hmm. Yeah. You don't like the 20% off any item coupon that we sent you? Yeah. How about a buy one, get one free coupon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then we got another one. Okay. Similar. This is from Alabama. Alabama Law Deposit Extension is the subject. Hmm. Dear Redacted, due to the COVID-19 emergency, Alabama law is extending the decision deadline to June 1. In addition, we no longer will require that you submit a deposit. If you do make a decision before June 1, please let us know by sending an email to me. The sooner we know your decision, the easier it will be for us to plan. We hope these two steps assist you in making the best choice about your future law school. We welcome your questions and look forward to talking with you. We would love for you to join the first year class at Alabama law exclamation point. Okay. So point is don't pay deposits. Yep. Like just, I mean, I'm not saying straight up ignore people, but (laughs) tell them that this is happening. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here we have two schools. One that is just saying we're not having deposits and another that's saying, you can ignore our deposit deadline and we'll offer you a better discount. So for all of you out there who are right now making your decision when they're like trying to force, I mean, cause they, I talk to students every day who are like, yeah, well they, they told me that, you know, my offer, my, my offer would be redacted or my, or whatever. My, my offer would, would, would expire if I don't pay this mm-hmm. deposit. Yeah. Do you think that that's, I mean, it could be real. But in, in right now, in the, these days, that can't, I it just, I, I like, please let me know if I'm wrong. Like if you've ignored a deposit deadline and they were like, Hey, sorry, we've taken away your offer. Let us know. Help at thinking com. I would love to know that. I think yeah. they're going to much more likely be like, Oh shit. Yeah. They have to realize how fucked they are right now. Yeah. Like, are they, I mean, law school in the fall. Is that happening? It'll happen, right? But it's going to happen mostly online. Well, it's going to happen. They got it. That's how they make their money. But yeah, especially now that schools are figuring it out, right? They're figuring it out for the current students. They're going to get the kinks worked out and they're going to say, heck, let's just do this. I just think that there's going to be, there. there's a, a, a not insignificant portion of the population for whom law school is purely a vanity investment. Like it just, it's just like a, I'm from a rich family. Of course I have to go to law school Yeah. and they want the like bullshit paper chase experience, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. like they want 
the stuffy professor up there yelling at people and the big, you know, they want to go to the campus with the Ivy on the walls and all that. They like want the full law school experience. Yeah. And I think those people are going to be like this year. Nah, Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people that are going to be walking away from all sorts of stuff this year for a million reasons. Yeah. Just like health and safety of their family. Their, their family member lost their job. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, what, what do you do when you're planning to go to law school this fall, but your wife got laid off? Yep. You can't, you're not just going to, surely you're not going to just go to law school anyway. Right. Yeah. So boy, I would just think you should, if we're, we're always hammering on the idea that you should negotiate, Mm -hmm. but boy, right now you should really negotiate. I would think you should be able to get some screaming deals right now. Yeah. Keep in mind when they give you a promo code, they're not losing money they're just not getting as much <laughs> yeah it's fake it's a hundred percent lie when they're like additional funds were just released yeah it's fake money it's not there's no money i mean they might you know have an account or whatever that they're earmarking it but it's it's all budgeted that's just budgeted that's, money it's not real money but that's only for people who are going for free because there is a cost associated with each student there is a real cost but that cost is very low and fixed to, yeah those costs are fixed they're not they're not like the facilities don't change based on how many students they have yep they've mm-hmm. already built those buildings And they're already paying those teachers salary. So, yeah, I mean, well, and the reality of what you're getting is so far removed from what the actual cost is. Right. I mean, their biggest costs are have to be facilities, salaries and recruitment. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Their their biggest costs have almost nothing to do with like actual education. I mean, yeah, they have a big ass classroom and yeah, they're paying somebody hundreds of thousands of dollars to, you know, some of the professors are making hundreds of thousands of dollars to teach the classes. But, but the, the bulk of what you're paying for is like the prestige and the prestige comes from the recruitment. So when they, when they talk to you about like, well, we, oh, well, you know, funds are fun. We have funds. Funds are limited though. It's just like, really? You, n- no, the, you have unlimited promo codes. You have unlimited Bed Bath & Beyond coupons. I'm just not <laughs> buying it. It's, it's fake. It's, it's not real. It's not real. Columbia charging $70,000 a year, Ben. That's not real. Not real. I would say that the actual cost, like the cost to them of providing that JD is much closer to $7,000 a year than it is to $70,000 a year. Oh, oh, for sure. Yeah. You just take, <clears throat> we figured it out, right? Like, oh, well, actually, I don't know. This would be my rough estimate. So what I would do is I would look at the number of people getting scholarships and figure out how much money they're actually bringing in. Yep. And I would predict that it's probably around somewhere between 25 and 50% of that actual number is probably their cost. And then the profits are the other 50%. That's my guess. So say the average that they're actually taking in is like half of what the sticker is. Yep. And then you're saying like 25 to 50% of that is the actual cost yeah like they're probably 50 yeah. percent is profit and 50 percent is is whatever their fixed well, costs and, are yeah and even then it's like uh, <laughs> that's just that's like taking into account like their whole operation right yeah uh, mm-hmm. uh, as far as costs but most of what those i mean uh, so much of what that cost actually is is just paying for unnecessary bullshit you know building yeah. these yeah. monumental bu- buildings for no reason so that they can slap their name on it or overpaying faculty and administrators and also just paying crazy amounts of money to recruit, including flying people across the country, putting them up in hotel rooms, (laughs) all that shit. (laughs) It doesn't have anything to do with the quality of education that you're going to get. Yeah. Anyway, don't pay for law school, man. Just uh, now more than ever. Right. And like, People ask me, like, does, it change? does the advice change now because of coronavirus? It's like, well, yeah, I'm doubling down on don't fucking pay. Minimize your risk. 100%. Oh, God. Potentially going into, you know, this is going to be on par potentially with the Great Depression. 
Who knows? I mean, yeah. it, well, it's just, it's going to be. It's worse than it is than the Great Depression or Great Recession, right? Are you saying Great Depression? I'm saying, I'm saying, I don't, I think it's blowing the Great Recession out of the water. Like 2008 yeah. is nothing compared to what it, n- nothing. It just depends on how quickly we recover, right? Yeah, but this is a, this is a collapse of the like global economy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like everybody is suffering. Everybody's hurting. And yeah. that is a bad fucking time to be paying for real expensive shit. Like if you're making the decision I did where I let, let ego influence where I went to law school, you know, when yeah. I turned down yeah. a scholarship to Golden Gate in order to go to Hastings because I thought it was prestigious and I paid $150,000 of tuition that I didn't have to pay. And I did that because I thought that I was a Hastings sort of person, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. that was real, real dumb when I did it but it would be way dumber now. Yeah. <laughs> this is not the time for frivolous expenditures. This is the time to be wise about your resources and time is one of those resources. And please, dear God, if you have a job that pays, don't quit your job. I mean, it could be great. It could be a great time to go to law school if you go for free and your job prospects aren't great right now. Right? Like, yeah, but it, that's assuming you go for free. Yeah. And so. <laughs> yeah. If you're unemployed and can't get employed and can go to law school for free, then yeah, it's, it's a great time. But I mean, I'm not optimistic about your job chances three years from now coming out of this. It took a long time for the legal job market to recover from the great recession in 2008. And again, like this is shows every indication of being way worse than that. Mm hmm. Hey, I want to say one thing about uh, this first sentence. It says, due to the COVID-19 emergency, Alabama law is extending the decision deadline to June 1st. Mm. This is just a grammar moment. Lawyers love the phrase due to. We see due to in personal statements all the time. And they're almost always, these, this phrase is almost always used incorrectly. Due to um, has to be modifying a noun, and in this case, it's actually modifying a a verb phrase. Alabama law is extending, but you don't have to worry about remembering all that. Just replace the phrase due to with caused by, and if the sentence doesn't make sense, use because of instead. So here, caused by the COVID-19 emergency, Alabama law is extending the decision deadline. It doesn't make sense. Mm -mm, It would be correct. To say, because of the COVID-19 emergency, Alabama law is extending the decision deadline. Like, if you said the traffic delay was due to an accident, that actually makes sense because you could say the traffic delay was caused by the accident. Due to is used correctly there. But bottom line is if you can replace due to with caused by, it's correct. If you can't, use because of. Interesting. All right. Also, Mm -hmm. this dude, Claude Reeves Arrington from University of Alabama Law is using two periods between his sentences. Yeah, it's so like, it's like almost like (laughs) blinding lights. (laughs) All this white. Yeah, it's not good. It's it's not good. It's not good. He needs to get with the modern times and go go to the one space. Yeah. Okay. Um, You want to read this uh, teaching English in Japan before law school? Sure. Yeah. Hi, Ben and Nathan. I love the podcast. Exclamation point. Thanks. What are your opinions on taking a gap year to teach English in a foreign country? For a year and a half, I have volunteered for a program in which I meet twice a week with an immigrant student to teach English. Okay. Uh, Now I'm thinking about applying to the Japan Exchange Teacher Program. If accepted to this program, I would live in Japan for at least one year, work a full-time job as an assistant language teacher, and earn a reasonable salary. I would like to take a gap year to gain experience before law school, save money, and become a stronger applicant. I'm a junior, and I would apply to the JET program at the same time that I would apply to law school. I am hoping to go to a law school ranked in the top 25 with a substantial scholarship, Uh -uh. edit, (laughs) promo code, okay, with a substantial promo code, sweet. Based on my recent practice tests, I think I will score in the mid to high 160s on the LSAT. I plan to take the July test 
I currently have a 3.7, but hope to have a 3.8, blah, blah, blah. I have worked part-time as a waitress throughout college, and I am involved in two extracurricular activities. Not sure that's super relevant. No. I have not done any internships while in college. Okay, not relevant. Do you think it is a good idea to apply for the JET program? Is this an experience that would strengthen my chances for acceptance and scholarships, uh, promo codes, at a top 25 <laughs> school? Do you recommend that I apply to both JET and law school this fall? Okay, so you're asking, is this going to help me get into law school? I don't think it's going to help too much, but I think you should 100% do it. Yes. Because if anyone who goes to a foreign country, especially for a long time, not just you know <laughs> a family vacation or a month or something like that, but a year or six months at least, is going to to have their perspectives changed. I guess you only have one perspective, but you're going to have your perspective on life change, and that it lo- that alone is going to be worth its weight in gold. When you said you're going to get a salary, you're going to have this job in a foreign country, I think that alone is awesome. Yep, I had a buddy may, from college who did the yep. this exact thing. Um, I'm not sure if it was this exact program, but it was definitely teaching English in Japan. He had an awesome time, totally transformative experience. Um, this is, yeah, absolutely don't do it because of law school. Just do it because you should do it. Yeah. And if you need to tie this back to law school while you're there, you may realize that, yes, I want to get back to the States and I want to go to law school. This is like more clearly where I want to go, or you may realize that it's not. And so either way, it's a win. And I wouldn't apply to law school until you're doing the program. The other thing to keep in mind is that you're not really going to have an opportunity like this as your life gets more and more complicated, whether that's marriage, kids, Yeah, once you go to law school, work. this is not yeah. happening. You're not, yeah. you're not spending a year in Japan. Teaching English and getting paid for it. No. no, this is a thing that you get to do when you're younger and before you have all those obligations and if you're, yeah, if you're doing any of that stuff in order to strengthen your chances of acceptance and promo codes, you're just not doing it right. Like, I don't give a shit about yeah. your extracurricular activities and your internships and stuff. That doesn't have as much effect on your law school admissions, especially if you're doing it for that purpose. Then mm-hmm. it has no effect anyway because it's just so obvious. Like, you did this three-month internship because you thought it would look good on an application. They, yeah. they care about your LSAT and GPA with if you end up with a he, this or she i guess says mid to high 160s and a 3.7 or 3.8 that should be enough to get you discounts at top 25 schools i would think yeah it ended up and all that other stuff doesn't really matter that much but do it for your life and people always are like horrified like what if i but what if i don't ever end up going to law school <laughs> That's a good thing. I know. Like, well, you, your future self knows more than your current self. Exactly. So trust your future self yeah. to make that decision. Best thing that ever happened to you. If you go do this and you realize that you have no interest in going to law school, like <laughs> dodge the bullet. So, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, speaking of that, you convinced me not to go to law school. Oh, that was Dell, by the way. Thanks, Dell. You convinced me not to go to law school after heating. Heading the advice. Ooh. Okay. After heeding the advice given on the Thinking LSAT podcast, I made a point to research the negative aspects of my decision to go to law school. Upon reading Don't Go to Law School Unless by Paul Campos, I decided to look towards alternatives to law school. What do you think about that comma after reading? Upon, yeah, I think <laughs> this person who cites themselves or calls himself another special sm- snowflake <laughs> is is going off of that thing in school where they're like if you quote someone you put a comma before the quote right, right. Like julie said comma quote yada 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 you don't put a comma before every instance that you use a quotation mark here i would just say upon reading i don't even actually i wouldn't even use quotes i would just if you want to f- punctuate it use italics i would italicize that yeah yeah but Uh, anyways yeah and okay anyway um so good you read the campos book we always recommend people read that book (laughs) but actually sorry 
you point out this extra comma in here, right? Yeah. But this person's lacking commas where he yeah, or she Yeah, after campos them. is where I would put it. Yeah, put it after campos. Also in the first sentence, it's after heeding the advice given on the Thinking LSAT podcast, comma, now your sentence begins, I made a point, blah, blah, blah. So... Second paragraph says, thank you so much for not only producing an incredible product for those preparing for the LSAT, but also providing free advice via your podcast to naive optimists such as myself. I am grateful for businesses like yours that care about the well-being of their consumers. My last note is a PSA to the podcast audience, assuming it makes it. When doing my research, I came to realize that being successful in your law career, on whatever terms that means for you, is not in many ways correlated to how hard you work. Hmm? Be open to other career options, and please, for the love of God, look at the statistics before applying to law school. Thanks again to everyone on the LSAT Demon and Thinking LSAT podcast team. I am still interested in pursuing law-related fields, just not ones that require a JD. Y'all are awesome. Best, another special snowflake. (laughs) that's funny yeah i love it when i talk people out of law school i made a horrible decision and i was like i was totally scammed by the admissions people and um it worked out fine for me but like yeah i am totally happy talking people out of law school even if when it means talking people out of business for me (laughs) because i just it's really like my mission in life to get people not to make the same stupid mistake that I made. So, yeah. And if it's not stupid for you, great. Yeah. If, We're not saying don't go, period. We're saying don't go unless, yeah. as Paul Campos says. Yeah. And don't pay. Even if you do go, yeah. there's just no point to paying because there's too many people that aren't paying. Yeah. That's the thing. I was talking talking to Namdi about it, and he he was like talking about how his offers, you know, like the the difference between going to Howard on a full ride or going to Columbia and paying like half price. Mm-hmm. And it's just like I think it's such a better deal to go to Howard on a full ride. It, it, yeah. it reduces the risk significantly. If you decide that that's not the right fit for you, you didn't pay anything. Not only that, but they'll love you at Howard if you're there on a scholarship. Like you're you are a special snowflake to them, right? If you're there on a full mm-hmm. ride, I mean. Yeah. If you're there on a full ride, then, you know, they're going to want you to succeed. Like they're, they've paid you to come there for a reason because they think you're going to be a baller. Yeah. And you can say that they paid you to come there because there are actual costs associated with you (laughs) or you got a hundred percent promo. If you got a hundred percent, yeah. hundred percent discount. But if it's, if it's one of these like 50% discounts, well then you're still paying $35,000 a year at a school like Columbia yeah. And they don't, what's their incentive to give a shit? You're just another, you know, <laughs> another body. Yeah. Anyway, um, thank you, Special Snowflake. Thank you. That was it. You guys can uh, always join the Thinking LSAT podcast group on Facebook. You can find us at Thinking LSAT on Instagram and Twitter. You can learn more about me at strategyprep.com and Nathan at foxlsat.com. But the reality is, if you want to prep for the LSAT, we would suggest you go to lsatdemon.com. That's where you can get your own app that knows exactly what you need to be working on at this moment. If you want to do classes with us, live online classes in Zoom, that's also at lsatdemon.com every day of the week. If you haven't seen our website, it's thinkinglsat.com. You can buy demon shirts and see the show notes. You can also sign up for the show notes, by the way. I think that's, we've talked about this before, but they're better than the show itself. (laughs) Um, And yada, yada. Anything else to add there? Nope. Okay, that was episode 242 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school.